you guys ready? You ready for the message this morning? Okay. This is message number five. I hope you're not bored yet. All right, good, 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 good. Message number five in our, our series called Pure and Spotless, where we're going through the book of Revelation. As I'm getting started, please keep passing the clipboards around. Once they make their way over to my wife, then we can just leave them over here, and I'll, I'll collect them later on. All right, my message title this morning is called No More L's. No More L's. Some of you get it. Some of you are like, what the heck? He's, he's always doing that. <laughs> so I'm going to inform you from the Gen Z dictionary, okay? L's just means losses. So what does W's mean? Oh my gosh, you guys are brilliant. So no more L's. No more losses. But it's literally no more L's. That's the name of my message today. And like I've said in many other sermons before, my message title is going to make sense as we go along. As we go along at it, all right? We're going to finish off Revelation. Everyone okay over there? Anything to share? I guess I'll start. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We're going to finish off Revelation chapter 2 this morning. Only took us five weeks to do that. Uh, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics to preach on, sexual immorality. Wow. Yeah, I know some of you are probably like, oh, he is just, I'm never coming back. Yeah. Never coming back. Now, <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. I say that, I say that it's my favorite thing to preach on, and I actually love having conversations around this topic with people because this was an area in my life where I had one of my greatest W's. Of all the things that, that I have experienced and done in life where I have had distanced myself from the Lord, I, I have, you know, outside of sexual sin, I have other things part of my past. I have a drug past. I don't really talk about it a lot because it was so long ago, but I mean, I did. My, my whole senior year of high school, like, I, I couldn't even really tell you half the things that happened because a lot of times I would leave for lunch and I was too high to come back to school, so I just didn't go back. <laughs> I could barely walk. That's just how it was, and that lasted for probably a good five years or, or so where it was just every day was just get up get high, stay high all day long. In my mind, there was two kinds of people in the world, those who were high and those who weren't. Some of you get me. But when it comes to, to sexual immorality, I love to talk about it because I want to see the kingdom of darkness crushed. And I want to see people struggling with sexual sin freed and experiencing the taste of victory and triumph. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I've since I've been walking in freedom, I've come to understand by talking with some other men especially that some have struggled with some sexual sin in their life for so long that they literally, I don't even know if, if they even think or believe that there is an end. That's how bad it can get. It's just as bad as cocaine addiction or gambling addiction. Sexual sin and sexual addictions can destroy a person's life. But here's the good news. Jesus breaks every chain. Amen. Jesus breaks every chain. And that's why I love to talk about it. I love to talk about it because I want to see struggling people get set free. Now, I mentioned when we started the series that we were going to be going many weeks. I still have no idea how long this is actually going to take us. I am going to presume we will probably be at this series more than 10 weeks just because there's that many chapters in Revelation. But I am kind of under the assumption that after we get through the seven churches, now I don't know this. So I'm hoping I don't speak ahead of myself. And I just saw your shirt, Cindy. <laughs> I should not have looked. <laughs> no, it's okay. If you know, you know. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. So we'll probably be at this more than more than 10 weeks, but we might start condensing chapters after we get through the, the seven letters. We'll see how the, the Lord 
does things for us because we still got a lot of ground to cover in Revelation. All right, here we go. Without hesitation, we're going to jump right into things today. Uh, as we're making our, our, our way through the Apostle John's revelation that he received while he was exiled on the island of Patmos, we're venturing through these seven letters written to seven churches from the province of Asia Minor. So far, we've been through Ephesus. What do we remember about Ephesus? A church of patient endurance, no tolerance for evil, but eventually what happened to them? They fell away from their first love and they grew cold. Then we talked about Smyrna, not to be confused with the Smurfs or New Smyrna. I'm just saying, it happens. <laughs> the only of the seven churches that still exists today, the rich, poor church, remember that? Great persecution they suffered. They were well acquainted with it. And then Pergamum that we talked about last time, a church that held fast didn't deny their faith in Jesus, but they had this really bad problem. Remember? Tolerance. They were, they were a tolerant church. Didn't deny faith in Jesus, but simultaneously were a tolerant church. They, they, they allowed sexual immorality and idolatry to make its way into the church. Today, we're going to look at a letter written to the church of Thyatira. This is the fourth church addressed in Revelation chapter 2, which is going to cause us to close out chapter 2. And if you remember, these seven churches of what was then Asia Minor, remember how we talked about they were relatively close in proximity to one another. And I gave you this example that uh, from Ephesus to Smyrna was like Utica to Rome. And then Ephesus to Pergamum is like Utica to Syracuse to give you an example of how close in proximity they were to one another geographically, and they were on this like circular trade route. The way, if you looked on a map, the churches kind of went like this. They, they, they went like this. It was a circular trade route. More, not so much circular, more like a horseshoe kind of thing. Thyatira was located about 40 miles southeast of Pergamum. So we start at Ephesus, and then we work our way up about 35 miles or so to Smyrna, and then we, we go uh, about another 30 to 40 miles up to Pergamum, and now we're going to make this bend. This bend southeast and start working our way downward to the church of Thyatira. Now, Thyatira became part of the Roman Republic, because remember, this was all Roman rule back then, but they became part of the Roman Republic back in 133 BC. And they are located in, you probably are going to guess it, where do you think they are located presently, Thyatira? What country? Turkey, Turkey. yes. <laughs> Turkey. All of these churches in Turkey, they, uh, they now are known as the city of Asikar, Asikar, Turkey. Biblical Thyatira is now Asikar, Turkey. Now, Thyatira was of the, the seven cities addressed in these seven letters. They were the smallest and possibly even looked at as the least significant. Smallest, maybe the least significant, but... What's interesting is they actually possessed the most trade guilds than any other city their size in Asia Minor. And if you're wondering, well, Chris, what the heck is a, a trade guild? Just think like a worker's union, like unions that we have today. Some people are part of a union or an association, something like that. That's what a trade guild was. And Thyatira... Even as small as they, they were, they, they possessed more of them than any other cities their size in Asia Minor. Now, these, these trade guilds had tremendous power and influence. And we're going to talk about that more as we go along this morning. They had so much power and influence, they literally could regulate competition and prices. That's how much power they had. Now, although small, Thyatira was a center of business and trade. So what in the world is Jesus writing and what exactly is he saying to the church there at Thyatira? Let's get into that. We're gonna go into Revelation chapter two, verses 18 through 29. I'm gonna to read to you from the New Living Translation. Let's just take a minute and pray and thank the Lord for his word today. And we're going to get started. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is anointed. We choose right now to open our eyes and our ears to hear what it is that you have to say. 
I ask you to anoint my mouth to speak only the things that are of you, Lord. We thank you this morning. We know you're here. You're moving. You're doing great things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Revelation 2, starting at verse 18. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. When I read that, it makes me kind of think of like Liam Neeson and any of the Taken movies, right? And he's like on the phone, and he's like, I know all the things you do. Could you imagine Jesus calling up? I know all the things you do. Oh. <laughs> I know all the things you do, but it's good news. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Whew, right? Thank you, God. But I have this complaint against you, he says. Mm, I knew it was coming. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent. She doesn't want to turn away from her immorality. Verse 22, therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truths as they call them, depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give Authority over the nations, they will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Okay. If you remember, we started a few weeks ago, as we're reading these letters, we were looking at these parallels, remember? We're looking at these parallels within these letters, and, and these are parallels of how Jesus is, he's introducing himself and, and revealing himself, and then what he says, and then whether he encourages or rebukes or both. And then what he promises. And if you remember of the seven churches, three of them received both praise and a rebuke, Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, Two received only praise, yay, Smyrna and Philadelphia, and only two, two of them just got rebuked, big sad, Sardis and Laodicea. So we see here Thyatira got both, praise and a rebuke. I see you guys got love, faith, service, great patience, that's super great, but you've got this Jezebel of a woman in your church. I just got to talk about her for a moment. Let's wrap unwrap some of these parallels and, and see exactly how this expands for us. So Jesus in Revelation 2 verse 18, he opens up and he introduces himself by revealing himself boldly as the son of God. This is the only letter that he opens up and he just cuts right to the chase. The only of the seven letters opens up, dear Thyatira, I am the son of God and this is my letter to you. I don't know if that was me, I'd be like, Time to put my listening ears on. That's how he intros, and that's how he gets started before he gives this more specific and unique revealing of, of who he is. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, whose eyes are like flames of fire. You know how like when you were young and your parent, all they had to do is just stare at you. When you did something, you were acting up. They didn't have to say a word. You just, and you were like, you stopped in your tracks, right? Eyes like flames of fire. Or sometimes the way a wife looks at her husband, we're not going there. I'm just, I'm joking. Eyes like flames of fire whose feet are like polished bronze. Jesus is giving a very strong revelation of himself in this introduction. Essentially, now stating 
His eyes emphasize penetrating judgment. Yikes. Those two words just sound awful to me when they're put together. Penetrating judgment. And then he says, my feet, like polished bronze, emphasizing steadfastness, strong, immovable. Just like when your parent stands there and goes, and they just look at you and you just know, everybody stop what you're doing. We're in trouble. Why does the church of Thyatira need to hear this? First, I'm going to share with you some of my personal thoughts. My personal thought, as as I've read and as, and as I've studied, is that these revelations of who Jesus is highlights the kind of purity that we're called to as his children, the kind of purity that we're called to have as God's children, because brass is pure and highly refined in fire. It's strong, depicting a stance of devotion that is immovable. And his, his eyes like flames of fire depicting that the gaze of the Lord upon our lives should cause us to stay in check. Would you think? The gaze of the Lord. He's always looking and watching. And neither his judgment or his reward is coming with him. He's looking and he sees. Should cause us to think, I ain't getting anything that's going over his head. Not, <laughs> that ain't happening with Jesus. He sees all. So we should be ever so mindful of what we allow our eyes to gaze upon and what we allow into our mind, what kind of thoughts we allow ourselves to be subject to. So in verse 19 comes the praise for the church of Thyatira. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance. I can see your constant improvement And all these things. This church has got some really good stuff going on. And it seems like they're growing. Small. Considered of the seven, the the least important. Thyatira locationally, you know, somewhat considered these things. Of the seven cities. But they were not overlooked by Jesus. They were not overlooked. And specifically, he's telling them, I see your love. I don't just see you, but I want you to know, I see your love, and I see that you have a lot of patience, and I see your faith. I see that you are a people who are servant-hearted. I see these things. In many ways, Thyatira was actually looked at as a model church. They had love for God and for one another. Servant-hearted, they had both faith and patience. All of these things worthy of mention by Jesus. Here's the thing, though. This is all good, and all churches should have these things. We should all be doing these things. Love, serving, having faith, great patience. What could be wrong, then? What was this rebuke from Jesus all about? Who's this Jezebelic woman What exactly are we unwrapping here? Okay, well, like Pergamum, the city, or the church rather, of Thyatira, they had the same issue of tolerance. Same thing. Pergamum was dealing with it. Thyatira also dealing with it. And their tolerance, likely, this is my own thoughts, as I was looking into this and looking at their church, My thoughts are is their tolerance came from a lack of depth. Yeah, they had love. They had faith. Servant-hearted. Great patience. There's probably a ton of churches in Utica where you could find all those things. But how many of those same churches would you say are deep churches? Churches that have deep wells. People who are a deep people. You see, if a church is not a church endeavoring into the deep things of God, the deep things of the Spirit, we could just be a people or we could be a church that just kind of hovers over the surface. It's like, it's like getting out into the water and going out a mile, but you're still only two inches deep. We can go really far. We're really great at this love thing, 
Man, we can travel so far out with it. We're really great at this patience thing. We know how to serve like nobody's business, but the water's still only two inches deep no matter how far out you go. That's not where God wants us to be. God wants us to go deep. However, when we go deep, we must stay anchored. We must stay anchored. Otherwise, here's what can happen. We could become capsized by the, the ferocity of the wind and the waves of things like culture, persuasion, like we're seeing in, in Thyatira, and we're going to get more into it as, as we go along and see exactly how, from their lack of depth, how some things came in, and they just were swept away by them. Other things like false teaching. False doctrine, if, if you're not endeavoring into the deep things of God, if you're not doing deep study, then how are you going to know when, when somebody else says this other stuff about God, how are you going to know when that's wrong and that's false? Unless you yourself are endeavoring into the word and you're taking the word and you're reading it and you're praying and you're, you're, you're getting your concordance out or you're going online and you're reading commentaries and you're, you're looking, you're not just only watching YouTube videos, but you're doing the research yourself. You're looking up these locations and you're, you're really going after it with God and you're letting God just to teach you and instruct you and inform you. Fanaticism is another thing. My gosh, nothing irritates me more than fanaticism in the church. Really just makes me want to knock some people out. I'm just being honest with you. Really does. I just, mm, some days I just want to, you know what I'm saying? Some of you know what I'm saying. Being Holy Spirit filled and led is something I believe the church of Thyatira possibly lacked. When we don't yield to the Holy Spirit, all we have left over is spiritual fluff. And you know what spiritual fluff is? Powerless. Powerless. Doesn't have any weight to it. How are you going to help the person who's got all sorts of bondage in their life if all you know how to do is love them? They need love, trust me. They need love. And all you know how to do is serve them. They need to be served too. But you know what they also need? They need someone who's going to get into the thick of it with them in prayer. They need someone who's going to not be afraid to come alongside them and keep them accountable and asking, how are you doing today? Did you this today? Did you that today? You shouldn't watch that. That's an open door. That's probably why you're messed up in this area like this. That's why we got to go deep with God so that we know more than just like we're riding on a bunch of hoverboards in the, in the spirit. Now, verse 20 states, and Jesus says, but I have this complaint against you. You're permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, most of us probably know Jezebel, but if you don't know Jezebel, in the Old Testament, Jezebel was the most wicked woman. Her story can be found in 1 Kings chapters 16 through 21, 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. She was one of the most evil characters in the Old Testament. So much so that you hear Christian people slinging that term around Jezebel spirit all the time. Call everything a Jezebel spirit. Some of them know what it is, and some of them have no idea what they're talking about. She attempted to combine the worship of Israel with the worship of the idol Baal. She was bad. In the church of Thyatira, there was a woman. We don't know her name. There was a woman. Some, some people believe maybe this was the pastor's wife. Yikes. Phew. Babe, I love you. You ain't this woman. You are perfect in every way. Or even worse, some think that if it wasn't the pastor's wife, it was the pastor's woman, whatever that means. <laughs> she claimed to be a prophet. She was not. 
and her teaching was utter poison. This woman was immoral and ungodly, a terrible influence, and worst part, she was in the church. And she was tolerated. And she's doing things. And she was never told, get out of here. Get out that door right now. She was never told. Now, remember the trade guilds? I told you we're going to come back around to that in Thyatira. Because of the strong trade guilds in Thyatira, the sexual immorality and the eating of foods sacrificed to idols was probably connected to these gatherings that these guilds would have, these get-togethers, these parties, these meetings they would hold. Likely that's what was happening, these two things. So I'm going to give you an example, right? You've got a Christian from the church in Thyatira, and because they're probably hovering on the service, they're not a real deep people. They got a lot of good things going on, but here comes this Christian, and they get an invite. Oh, oh, I'm invited to the guild party. Oh, where's this? Oh, it's at the Temple of Apollo. Hmm, should I go to that? Hmm, because remember, Thyatira is under Roman rule, so you know they worshiped Greek gods and things like that. This Jezebelic prophet, she, oh, go, go, go. It's, it's going to be a, a good time. You really should go. This is going to help your business. You get in with these people, and, and sometimes what she would do, this woman, is she'd give them a prophetic word. You should go. I believe God has said you fill in the blank. So here comes these men. They don't got enough depth to them to hold the weight of their Christianity. They go to these meetings, and what do you think happens? They fall into sexual immorality, and they eat meat sacrificed to idols. No depth to their devotion, not really spirit-led. And there was a lot of pressure to go to these meetings. It was very strong pressure because merchants and traders at this time, a lot of them thought to themselves, they really were going to only prosper in their businesses if they were part of these guilds. I've got to get in with the guild, otherwise my business might not take off. But you've got Christians who were merchants and traders, right? So here, here's the conflict. You might have, uh, you might have a, a Christian who's a painter, and they get contracted to paint a pagan temple. Well, they got to make a living, right? So here's the conflict. They go paint the pagan temple. Now they're associated with pagan idolatry. Instead of trusting the Lord for their income, they trusted their own ways. Or you might have a sculptor. A sculptor is contracted to sculpt a pagan god. And instead of standing up for their themselves and their faith in Jesus and saying, I could never do that. I worship God and God alone. Oh, I've got to make a paycheck. So I guess I'll make this pagan God. We must trust the Lord. Now, I understand these are difficult circumstances, and sometimes in life today we face similar difficult circumstances. I don't want to get super into it, but just I'm just going to say it because I, I said it last time. Some, some folks, some of you here, were fired from your jobs because you didn't take the COVID vaccine. But you didn't take the COVID vaccine because you refused to violate your conviction. And you know what I say to you? I'm proud of you. Now, I took the vaccine. Don't hate me, Okay. But then when I was told you need a booster after that, I was like, no, 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 no. You poked me once, and you poked me twice, but you won't poke me a third time. And now I think I have some mental issues because that vaccine, maybe, I don't know. I don't know where some of my memory loss comes from. I'm just saying, I don't know. And I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to do this whole, you know, pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine thing. I'm not, I, I don't care. I honestly don't care. But what I do think is important is if you felt you were not supposed to do it and you stuck to your guns and you got fired, 
I'm proud, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for not violating your conviction. Because you, you would have been worse off to violate your conviction and feel like you had sinned. That would have been worse. I'm glad that those of you who, who stuck it out, no pun intended, whatever. <laughs> the worst part for this Jezebel, a false prophet, as, is that she was given time to repent, according to verse 21, but she did not want to repent and she did not want to turn from her sexual immorality. She's another one that I just want to grab and just be like, Psh. God is giving you time. What is wrong with you? Unfortunately, it seems like we have this very same thing happening in the world today. An outright bold and vulgar disdain and rejection of God, Christianity, and Christians. It almost seems like overnight we became this minority. It's crazy. And when I say minority, I mean like I see some things online and there's such hate. Just hate for God and hate for Christians. And if you're like me, you're a white evangelical male, you might as well be dead in their eyes. They'd rather just see you eradicated off the face of the earth. You are the enemy times a million to them. And I'm like, how? You don't even know me. How did we get to that? Where's the data? Show me your research. There is none. You know what it is? It's demonic. It's demonic. The worst part is that when in the church, people are led astray. That's the worst part. In the world, we can understand because they call it sinful nature for a reason, right? It's natural when people sin. So but when, because people are sinning, I mean, let's not get too worked up because it's natural for us. But when that stuff comes into the church, okay, this is holy ground. That parking lot is holy ground. This is holy ground in here. Among us, there should be no immorality. There should be no drunkenness. There should be no addictions to things that are an idol and taking the place of Jesus. There should be none of that. To me, it's just worse when it comes into the church and people are led, led astray and then there's no repentance. It's one thing when, when, you, when you stumble, you fall, and then you get back up, you repent, you get delivered, you're back on your way. That's my story. But it's a whole other thing when there's no repentance. And I've seen the ugly side of that. I've seen when there's no repentance and people just leave the church. And then they continue in that lifestyle and they never repent of it. I, I see it. I know someone I have a, who used to be a close friend still doing it. And it's probably been over 10 years maybe 15 years, I don't know. Left their wife, their children, everything. I'm not even kidding. This is a very powerful kind of blindness and ignorance. This is deep darkness. Deep darkness. Because people aren't rooted in the truth of God's word. Christians. And they're not following the Holy Spirit, but instead they're following darkness. There are devastating consequences when time to repent runs out. Devastating consequences. In verses 22 and 23, Jesus says that if this Jezebelic false prophet does not repent and turn from her evil deeds, she will be thrown onto a bed of sickness and that her children, meaning her followers, will be killed, and not just killed, but killed with death. Now, if you're thinking, wait a minute, Chris. Uh, I thought that that's how that worked. When you die, you were killed with death, right? To be killed with death is something completely entirely different. When Jesus says, I'm going to kill you with death, 
I'm telling you right now, it's basically like him almost saying, I'm going to kill you, resurrect you, and kill you again. Now, that's not what he's saying. I'm joking, okay? That's not what he's saying. But th this is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. The Amplified Bible says in verse 23, instead of being killed with death, it says to be killed with pestilence. Meaning this, a thorough annihilation. So when Jesus says, I'm going to kill you with death, he says, I'm going to thoroughly annihilate you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If there's no repentance, I am going to thoroughly annihilate you. Oh, my gosh. That's what killed with death means. Think extermination. You know, when, when you, uh, you want to exterminate pests from your home. You hire an exterminator, they come, they bring their insecticide, that's a powerful chemical, and it has the potential to do what? Eradicate an entire species, including eggs, larvae, the whole thing, thorough annihilation. Pestilence, however, is a fatal epidemic disease, and Jesus states in verses 22 and 23, if there's no repentance, that both this Jezebelic false prophet and those who commit adultery with her, her followers. So her and her followers. He's going to bring into great anguish. They will suffer greatly, and this false prophet and her followers will be wiped off the face of the earth, completely annihilated. It's like Jesus is just taking the table and just going, do over. That's just an example. Then later Jesus says in the latter part of verse 23 that all the churches, not just the church of Thyatira, he says, but all the churches will know that it is he. He. Remember verse 18? How does he intro himself? Dear Thyatira, from the Son of God. That it is He, it is Jesus who searches the thoughts and intentions of the mind and the heart. According to the ancient Jews, quite literally, they, they meant the heart and the kidneys. Why? Meaning the innermost thoughts and purposes of human existence. The innermost. That stuff you don't tell anybody. Not even your closest homie. Maybe one knows, and it's probably because you did some of it with them. Outside of that, we don't talk about it. Don't nobody know. Don't ask me about it. It's going to the grave with me. But what does Jesus say? I got eyes like flames of fire. And I was there when you did it. I seen it all. And I'm giving you time to repent. Jesus says he will give to each according to whatever you deserve, whether it be reward or punishment, according to your deeds. This is not salvation by works. Don't get grace wrong because we're saved by grace through faith. But when you get saved, it is not one and done. You can go back and do whatever you want. You get saved, you're called into the pursuit of holiness. And you're given grace to empower you every day because somet sometimes we mess up. Remember what, what did I say last time? Sometimes we're awesome and sometimes we're poo-poo caca. Remember that? That's just, right? That's just life. Life's always lifing and sometimes we're stupid. We don't make the best decisions, but we have grace. We come. His mercies are new every morning. God, I repent. I'm sorry. That's not what I want. Please forgive me, God. Help me. Strengthen me, Holy Spirit, so I don't do that again. All right. Cool. Let's go. We'll start over. Right? No shame. No guilt. No condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who are what? Led? Follow? The Holy Spirit? Mmm. I think, I think Paul is on to something there. What we do and don't do is going to catch up to us. That's your tweetable moment. What we do and don't do is going to catch up. There's no sweeping it under the rug. There's no running away from it. There's no leaving things unaddressed. 
But while there is still time, there can be repentance. And with true repentance comes deliverance. Some of the folks that I just want to slap to the floor are the ones who think my only problem is a demon. I just want to choke them and tell them, no, that's just part of your problem. You only have the demon because of your sin. How about we deal with your sin? Then we can just go to the demon. Pew! You see, casting out demons is actually easy. It's actually easy. It's not this whole blown up thing. Like, like we, no, I'm, listen, I'm not smashing ministries that do the, I'm not, don't, don't, don't. You're not hearing me say that. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm just saying for, for the stuff that is out there, that exists out there in the world of Christianity, I just want to be like, come on, guys. You are making this look like it is like spook fest. How about we lead these folks into repentance and tell them, you want to get the demons out. You got to deal with the sin. You're not just going to keep binding, casting out, and just think, I'm free. Ah. And then you go back and you watch porn later that day. Yeah. Or you go back and, you know, drowning yourself in a 12-pack that day. <laughs> Open door, right again. Now you're starting all over again. It's keeping these demons out, keeping darkness out through repentance and a life lived in holiness that for some reason has become the challenge for the Christian. I, I just, I, I really hate that that's part of our reality. The walk of holiness and true repentance. Now, I'm not standing up here telling you I've got it all put together and I do everything perfect every single day. You want to know the truth of stuff? Just talk to this lady right here. And she'll tell you, mm hmm But I, I will tell you this. I've had some real battles, and I've fought some real junk, and it took real repentance and real vulnerability. I've stood from this very platform, and I've told you guys my story. Six years of my life, I was addicted to pornography as a Christian. Worst time of my life. Worse than when I was doing drugs, worse than the immorality that I was in prior to my relationship with Jesus. Being a Christian and being on a platform leading people in worship and stumbling into pornography and then it taking six years to come out of it. And, th and you don't even know how many rounds I went through of binding demons and casting them out and binding them and casting them. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. But when I finally came to the brink and I was told by Pastor Robert, he said, Chris, if you don't get to 100% of this, you may not enter your destiny. And that did it for me right there. I, at that point, realized I have a sin issue that I can no longer just leave the way it is. I've got to stop. And that was it. My deliverance was like super easy. No, it was. It was just I had, I had the day. I had the revelation, repented, and now I'm walking totally free and clean and in total authority. Or, yeah, yeah. And now, now, when, now when, I, when, I, when I have an opportunity to help other men, I just, I just want to, I'm like, oh, I know you. I, I know you. You're, you got it coming. You better run. You better run. See, once you disassociate from the kingdom of darkness, once you divorce yourself from the works of sin and evil, and you no longer have anything in common with them. See, that, that's what it's all about right there. You've got to break the commonality. We don't have anything in common, me and those sexually immoral spirits. We don't have anything in common anymore. So now when they try to show up on the scene... You know, I do my Muhammad Ali dance. Let's see it. No. <laughs> it's all in my head, Pat. I'm glad you guys are so cool.
The church of Thyatira, starting in verse 24, Jesus, he's saying that to those who don't hold the teaching of Jezebel and false prophets and false teaching, those who have not explored deeper truths, depths of Satan, as the Amplified Bible calls it, Jesus says, I place no other burden on you. This is, we're, we're going to get into something that's going to be another tweetable thing. It's just around the corner here, and we're almost done. He says, I place no other burden on you. I ask nothing more of you than to hold tightly to what you have until I come. Jesus never said, study demonology, and then you'll know how to live more free. Never said that. He never said, go and study demonology, and then you'll know how to live more free. Never said it. Finding demons and casting them out, that is part of our kingdom work. That is part of it. And that is part of the authority we've been granted by Jesus. And we are to help others who are in bondage. That is part of it. What I'm just saying is this. Know your priorities. Know your priorities. Do not rejoice in the fact that the demons, the spirits submit to you. But what does scripture say? Rejoice in the fact that your names are written where? Written in the Lamb's Book of Life, written in heaven. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're actually told. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 10. We're not going to throw this up on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you. This is, this is what we're actually told, okay? Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Now, that doesn't mean be one of those, you know, heresy hunters. Right. Don't be one of those. For the cheese, don't. <laughs> Verse 12, it is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. That's what we're told. That's what we're told. Ephesians 5, 10 through 12. Why? Because the church Jesus is returning for is one without, if you are wondering, when are we going to get to it? One without what? Spot or... Oh, and what is our theme verse? Ephesians 5. Yes. And it says that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such things that she might be holy and faultless. Stand and watch. Be prepared. Hold tightly. Chill out. Live holy. Love your neighbor. Bear with each other's burdens, serve one another, make disciples, and for crying out loud, stop worrying about other things. To cap things off, starting in verse 26, Jesus states that those who are victorious, those who obey him in the very end, he says he will give authority over the nations. These victorious ones will rule the nations with an iron rod, smash them like clay pots. I just think, I don't know why I think like golf club and like psh, I don't know why I think that, but, and they will have the same authority Jesus received from God the Father, and he will also give them the morning star. Wow, what is he saying? He says this, to the faithful, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged, faithful ones, by the wickedness all around you. What's he say, Val? Keep on keeping on. I'm so glad you're here this morning, because when I wrote that, I thought of you. God's work will continue through you. Jesus promises a share to the faithful of his own kingdom. And he reminds us that we're on the winning team. And the greatest reward that he promises to the faithful is this, himself. When he says, I promise you the morning star, Revelation teaches us, Jesus is the bright and morning star. The greatest reward he promises is he says, you get all of me. Wow. Better than streets of gold. Better than a mansion in a home that somehow has other mansions. I don't know how that works in heaven. Wow. This letter to the church of Thyatira applies to all churches and all Christians. It applies to those who are like Jezebel, who lead others into sin, who both practice and tolerate false teaching and false prophets. It applies to the faithful who are told to hold tightly and who are 
In summary, Jesus reveals himself to be the one with eyes like flames of fire, feet like bronze, who himself is steadfast and encourages his faithful followers to do the same. Hold fast, be steadfast, hold tightly. His eyes like fire see all that we participate in and tolerate and, and that which we don't. And we're going to be given whatever we deserve, reward or punishment. And I'm going to close out very specifically like this this morning. Did you notice, because we, we talked about it, so it was probably pretty obvious at some point, and the way Jesus dealt with the sexual immorality in the church of Thyatira, not as a demonic root, even though there was a Je- Jezebelic spirit there. Even though there was a Jezebelic presence there, and he called it out specifically, he did not deal with the sexual immorality as a demonic root. What did he deal with it as? In its original form, sin. Because, because why? He required repentance and a turning away. The door to darkness only gets opened when we make the choice to participate and become affiliated with darkness. That's the only way it gets open. When we choose to sin, the devil doesn't grab our hands and he doesn't go onto your computer and you're like, I can't stop myself. www.badvideos.com. Doesn't happen, right? Are we being honest? Mm. And the way we're going to get free is when we decide we're ready to be vulnerable and expose darkness in our own lives. Because what did we read in Ephesians 5? What did Paul say to the Ephesians? Don't participate in it, but expose it. But don't be the heresy hunter. If, if, the, if there's something in our lives, let's not be afraid to rip the sheets off and say, I'm ready to be free. This is what I've been hiding from everyone. But I'm ready to be free from it. I want to invite you to stand. Don, what you shared with me earlier, does it tie into this moment right now? Sure. Come on up. Come on up. Don is my broski. So when he says, Chris, I have something I believe is from the Lord, yeah. I don't need to hear him say it to me. Okay. We're just going to wait on, yes, God bless you. We're just going to wait on the Lord. Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead, Don. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This, this is an encouraging word, and it lines up with everything Pastor Chris has been saying and said today. Okay? So one of the scriptures I'm going I'm to paraphrase, of course, is Hebrews. Okay? And Hebrews says to us, do not forsake the gathering together, mm-hmm. especially as you see that day coming. Okay? And that day, most people believe is the rapture. And, and they're right, okay? But God impressed something on my heart, and he said that he wanted me to share this with everyone here. He said, yes, it's the rapture, and that's going to be the removal of the church. But he said, think of it like this. It's the end of the church age. It's over. We're gone. What hope is the world going to have when we're gone? Not much. Not much, right? Okay? So, right here, this is... This is the invitations, okay, for the revival and block party right here, okay? Have 300 right here, 300, okay? So what I'm asking is Pastor Chris, myself, David Traglia, anybody else who wants to join us sometime this week, Mm -hmm. right? We're going out. We're going out there where the lost are, right? Two more scriptures, okay, quickly. Thank you, brother, for... Mm -hmm. He told me it wasn't a mini-sermon, so... It's not. It's not, I promise. No, I'm I'm just... I'm messing with you. I know. So Isaiah chapter 60, 1 through 5, and I'm stealing David Traglia's thunder here because he prophesied that with me over the phone as we were speaking about handing out these invites. So quickly it says, Arise shine Mm -hmm. for your light has come Mm -hmm. and the glory of the lord is risen upon you 
For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising church. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. They come to us. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy. Mm. Praise God. Okay, and then one more supporting scripture here. It's going to be out of Acts 18, chapter, uh, Acts 18, verses 9 and verses 10. Now, this is powerful, church. I want you to get to speak because this is what we're doing, right? It says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the, in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you for I the Lord have many people in the city that's all of us we're gonna we're gonna end now and I'm gonna pray two specific things over you as we as we close out and as we end this morning you guys can go ahead and put the the music on as we're ready to close out here I want to I wanna give you an invitation, not publicly, because I'm not looking to cause anyone to feel embarrassed or ashamed. You guys can kick the track on if you have it ready. But if, there's, if there is an issue in your life that you're ready to deal with, I'm going to ask men that you be honest with yourselves and that you reach out to me this week. So we can begin the journey. And ladies, I'm going to ask you to do the same and reach out to my wife. Please do not let your needs go unaddressed. Something that my wife and I were talking about this past weekend was we just feel sometimes enough people aren't coming forward with what you need help with. Now, we're not saying you're bad or anything. We're not saying anything. We're just simply saying is we want you to know this is a safe place and we want you to know we're not perfect. We've done some things, but we've also conquered some things. And, and there may be us and some other people that we can help partner and bring into your life to help you if you've got something that you need help with. So that's all we're saying is if, if, if you need it, you need the help, we're here for you. So guys, if you need that help, I want you to know I'm just a phone call or a text message away to you starting that journey. And some of you have reached out to me. And I just, I love it. I love it when I get those messages. I'm like, yes, my favorite stuff to talk about. To be able to watch somebody else get freedom. And then ladies, please reach out reach out to my wife. Now, when we're done and we invite you up for prayer, if you want prayer today, please don't leave without getting prayer. How many times have some of us left and thought, man, I wish I had got prayer or, oh, they look too busy or whatever. Please, please, if we look like we're busy, just grab us. Just grab us. Say, I, I need prayer. We're not going to shun you or turn you away. And here's what I'm going to pray over you and then you're released. If you're feeling the pressure right now in life of some kind of overwhelm and some kind of stress, you're carrying some kind of burden. I don't know what it is, but I, I feel something and I've felt it specifically in this neighborhood and I feel like the Lord has revealed to me that there's a taunting spirit in this community and in this neighborhood. A taunting, which is like a bullying spirit. And I feel it because sometimes when I'm here and it's just me and maybe a couple other people, I feel that fear in me when I walk outside. And I, and, and I see some folks walking around and, and I'm wondering, 
Are they saying things about me? What are, you know? Now, some of it may just may be me. It may not, all, it may not be all truth. It may not be any truth. I don't know. But I, I, from, from the things that we have experienced that are truths, damage that's been done to the building, encounters and confrontations we have had, I see it. I see the rebellion. And we see it on the news. There was a tragic death just not too long ago, just a few blocks away on Shaw Street where a teenager was killed because of an encounter he had with the police and he pulled out a weapon that w- was not an actual, I mean, it was a BB gun, but he pulled it out and he got shot and killed because of it. What is happening? Don's up here encouraging us and telling us we are the hope of the world. These, this, is, this is utter chaos out here. And what's it gonna take? Well, we've got two opportunities coming up on the 13th and 14th where we're going to get out onto the street with them. I know that we don't all live here. And I understand how challenging that can be for us. Some of it can be intimidating. But what did, what did Don read for us this morning from Acts? Do not be afraid. No harm is going to come to you. Why? Because there's more of him. Greater is he. Come on. Can we start living by it? And I'm going to tell you something. I need you to encourage me with that. Because I, I, get, I get weighed down under the pressure too. So much so sometimes that I'm just like, I don't even want to be there. I'm only going to go there if I got to be there. I'm human too, just like you guys. So let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come right now. Your word declares that we have not been given a spirit of fear. We prophesy that right now. We prophesy your word. We have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. We declare right now that our minds are sound and we are not afraid. And we're not looking for a scuffle. But what we are looking is for redemption. What we're looking for is for hurting hearts to be healed. What we're looking for is to see those who are in sin seize the opportunity to repent. And that by the example that we lead before them, that they would see you are worth it all, Jesus. Help us to do that, to show them you're worth it. So we surrender the battle into your hands right now, Lord. The battle belongs to you. It's not our battle. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness. We wrestle against darkness and high places. But the battle is yours. And you already have the victory, Jesus. We declare it. So right now, for those who may be here this morning, if you're feeling weighed down by a burden, the stresses of life just feel like they're just really hammering at you. You're just overwhelmed. You're burnt out. God, I ask you to just refresh right now by your spirit. I ask you to restore and heal bodies right now, Lord. I ask you in the name of Jesus to revive, Lord. Revive and strengthen by the power of the Holy Spirit the weary, Lord. Lord, we bind weariness right now. You've told us do not grow weary in well-doing. We speak that over ourselves right now. We will hold tight because you said, Jesus, I laid no other burden on you than to hold tight onto what you have. So Lord, we'll stand fast. We'll hold tight. We still got questions. We still got things. But we're not going to get flustered and we're not going to give up and we're not going to give in to weariness and fear we declare we are full of the holy spirit right now i would encourage you as we end this prayer say that over yourself i am full of the holy spirit 
I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I have everything I need in Christ Jesus. I don't lack anything. I have everything I need and I'm fully satisfied in you, Lord. I'm fully satisfied by you. I don't need external things. I don't need this and that and the other thing. I've got everything I need in you and I'm fully satisfied. There's nothing greater than you, Jesus. You are the bright and morning star in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are done. If you would like prayer, please come up. I'll make sure I hang out and we'll have some people from our our prayer team available to pray with you. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here this morning. You are loved. Amen. Try to stay cool. Enjoy the rest of the day.